Hi, I'm Tom Sai. I'm a surgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital and uh, medical director for health policy for research for the American College of Surgeons. I'm joined today by Dr. Chris Childers um, to discuss uh, some of our recent research around um, CMS's uh, proposed efficiency adjustment for surgical procedures. Chris, why don't you just first explain yourself and um, tell us a bit about yourself. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Chris Childers. I'm a, I'm a liver and pancreas surgeon at the University of Washington. Um, I'm also kind of a health policy researcher and have, have spent the past eight years or so really studying the physician fee schedule in a lot of detail. And so uh, when this topic came up over the summer, um, it was right up my alley and I decided to jump in and, and see if I could add something to the conversation and provide some evidence about this important topic. Yeah. Um, and let's first take a step back and can you just explain... Um, what the efficiency adjustment is uh, to the procedural CPT codes. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I don't want to belabor the entire physician fee schedule and, and its history, but the, the very basics are when a surgeon does a procedure, um, we can describe that procedure to payers using what are called CPT codes. Um, each one of those CPT codes, let's say I'm taking out a pancreas, um, has a code, and that code is associated with a certain valuation, what we call work RVUs. Uh, that's a number that allows us to communicate uh, across different payers and allows us to standardize uh, the payment that, uh, for each of those operations. And the efficiency adjustment is something that was proposed by CMS over the summer. It was finalized uh, in their final rule at the end of October. Um, and essentially, at, at, its, at its bare minimum, the idea is that CMS believes that surgical procedures have gotten more efficient over time, perhaps through uh, technology or just through other measures of us getting more efficient. Um, and as a result, those work RVU numbers that we talked about uh, should go down um, over time. And they proposed uh, that it, in 2026, that all of the work RVUs for surgical procedures and actually even a broader array of codes Codes, everything that they call non-time-based codes uh, should go down by two and a half percent on the idea um, that we are getting more efficient over time. Yeah. So, Chris, that you know is going to lead me to ask, you know, is that idea based off of data, and or what what do the data actually tell us about what the uh, length of procedures have been uh, over time for surgeons in the U.S. Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. So when CMS put out their proposal, they cited an, you know several papers that that they frequently reference that talk about doing some sort of um, analysis that compares maybe some data from Medicare to actual operative times. And and there's been some suggestion in that past literature uh, that there may be some inaccuracies inaccuracies in the fee schedule. And that was what they pointed at when they put out the proposed rule. But what we wanted to do is we actually wanted to, to answer the question that they were posing. And the question that they were asking and what they were hypothesizing was they said surgeries are more efficient today than they were five years ago. And as a researcher, I was like, I can figure out whether or not that's actually true. And I can use robust data that we have readily available to us to answer that question. And so as soon as that rule um, was proposed in July, we jumped into action and we used a data set. And I want to spend just a little bit of time uh, walking through the methodology. And, and I apologize if some of this is a little bit technical, but we used a, a data registry that's been around for over 20 years. It's called the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program or NISQIP for short. Um, this is a program that um, collects data from over 700 hospitals in the United States. The data is not claims data. It's not data that's just generated through the usual course of business. This is actually data that's created um, by trained nurses at each of those individual hospitals who manually go through the medical record um, and they find out information about that patient. And they can find out information about how long that operation actually took. They can learn information about the patients, their risk factors, their comorbidities, whether or not they had complications. That data is manually abstracted. And if they don't have that data, they actually call the surgeon or they call the patient to get that information. So this is robust data that's been collected and validated over a 20-year time period. Um, and I knew that we we could use that database to answer this question about whether or not we have gotten more efficient over the last five years. And so high level, we took data from 2019 and 2023, and that's a five-year uh, span of uh, time. We excluded some of those middle years for COVID because we didn't know what was happening with surgical procedures during that period, and it might have been kind of atypical. And what we did was we looked at 
the most common surgical procedures that are performed in this country. These are things like mastectomies, taking out gallbladders, hip and joint replacements. And what we did was we looked at actual operative times abstracted by those trained nurses in 2019. And we looked in 2023 and we looked to see whether or not we were actually getting quicker in the operating room. And sure enough, we looked at 249 different types of operations spanning the gamut of 11 different surgical specialties. And sure enough, what we actually found was that for 90% of those operations, those operations are actually the same length of time. And actually for a large number of them, we're actually getting slower. We're actually spending more time in the operating room than we were five years ago. And so we were pretty surprised um, by those findings, especially the fact that we're getting longer over time. Although I will say that when I brought this back to surgeons like myself and others, it rang true to a lot of them because they know that they are taking care of sicker and more complex patients over time. And it just made sense to them that we're not getting any more efficient. And in fact, we're actually having to spend a little bit longer in the operating room. So that's the high level overview. Happen to dive into any more details. Yeah, and I think um, let's talk a little bit about the methodology because um, I think that's a question that's come up. Um, and um, one of the advantages of using the NISQIP uh, participant use file is that this data we want it to be transparent, and that this could be replicated, you know, by the surgeons and researchers affiliated with any of those seven hundred hospitals. Uh, so that the, these data and these analyses could be reproducible. But we also focus on a set of procedures that were uh, common. Can you talk a little bit more about that in terms of methodology? You know, were these one-off procedures with only one surgery in the sample? Or, you know, what was some of the thought process about some of the criteria of, of, of the selection of these, uh, you know, almost 2 to 50 procedures? Yeah, yeah, really important question. So we really wanted to focus on things that are high yield high volume, not just in this quip, but in, in Medicare in general. And that's where the policy is being implemented. Um, and so we only looked at procedures in this quip that are performed at least a thousand times. So these are not these one-off rare operations. These are operations, like I mentioned, these are spine procedures. These are appendectomies, gallbladder removals, hernia repairs, hysterectomies, hip and joint replacements. These are your bread and butter, general orthopedic gynecology, ENT, urology, neurosurgery procedures that are performed day in and, and day out. We looked at, as I think the paper says, 1.7 million operations that were performed over those two years. And when you look at how much was actually spent in um, Medicare over that same period for those same operations, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so these are these are high volume procedures. These are high costs for Medicare. Um, this is your bread and butter stuff. And that's what we wanted to focus on. We didn't want to focus on those rare operations. And also from a method, methodology standpoint, these are um, procedures where we can actually make sure that there was signal and not noise. That these are not one off, that this wasn't just a an outlier, uh, you know, procedures that were long. We wanted to make sure that there was a lot of confidence um, that we were truly reflecting the average length of time over these procedures, um, you know, over the last five years. But Chris, you know, I'm a I'm a practicing general surgeon, um, and one of our most common procedures is um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy or gallbladder surgery. Tell me a little bit about that, you know, in terms of what that's like in um, in terms of the, what the procedure length has been over the last five years. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, we've got a number of, of high volume procedures that um, that most people have heard about, things like removing a gallbladder. Um, and for I'm just pulling it up right now for for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. That's the, the fancy medical term for removing a gallbladder through small incisions. Um, our data set had 72,000 of them um, when we looked at 2019 to 2023. And the operations on average are taking 12 percent longer uh, today than they were in 2019. Um, and, and just to kind of to touch a little bit on on why that might be the case, um, you know, the database that we have access to has a lot of granular information about who these patients are, what their risk factors are, um, whether or not they're going to be at risk of having complications and problems postoperatively. Um, and we were able to get a little bit of information about maybe why we're seeing these operative times get longer. And so for, for gallbladder removal, that's a, that's a good example, 12% longer. And when we look at some of these individual characteristics, what we found was that patients that we're operating on these days um, are older. Um, they have accumulated more medical comorbidities over time. Um, they have what are called higher um, 
ASA score. So ASA score is something that's a pl- that is assigned by the anesthesiologist to the overall risk of that patient before the operation. Um, so all of those things were longer. And I think anecdotally, what I would tell you is that um, as we're taking care of these patients, more and more of these patients are either presenting with advanced pathologies. They have had more surgeries over time. So they're accumulating adhesions and altered anatomy and just everything about these patients um, is getting more challenging over time. And I think the data is really kind of bearing that out um, in this data set. That's great. So Chris, what do you think is the main take home, um, you know, for this, you, you know, you sort of mentioned, um, the policy, um, while there may have been a lot of concerns or, or questions raised, the assumption that uh, underlies this um, 2.5% cut to the work RVUs is that surgeries are getting shorter uh, with time. Um, so what's sort of the, the takeaway that, that we, should, we should have from, from this research study? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the data just doesn't support what CMS is doing. I mean, I think that's, that is... Very clear in this data. I think it's hard to refute. I think it is what we're seeing in practice as well. Um, When I talk to surgeons around the country, they all feel this. They all feel like they're taking care of more complicated patients over time. They're pushing the boundaries of what can be done. Our coding system doesn't account for those nuances. We don't get to a code for more complicated things over time. Um, And so we're seeing this. We're seeing this on the ground. And and I think that CMS... um, you know, I think the thing that for me is so striking about reading through CMS's final rule is that they emphasize the need to rely upon data to inform these decisions. And this, in my opinion, is as good of data as we can have, and it's showing the exact opposite effect. And so I think everybody you and I are both researchers. We fully support modernizing fee schedules and bringing good data to the forefront to make those decisions. But you can't start by making a decision when you have the data pointing you in the exact opposite direction. Um, so, you know, I think that's that's my takeaway is we're bringing data into this argument. We are interested in bringing data moving forward into modernizing the fee schedule. Um, and right now the data does not support uh, this current policy. Yeah, and I think the... You know, it's undeniable that we have a chronic disease epidemic in, in in our country with obesity, heart disease, diabetes. But those same patients with obesity, heart disease, and diabetes with chronic disease also are undergoing operations, um, oftentimes to treat uh, you know the um, you know, kind of final consequence of their chronic disease. Um, so it's uh, you know really important for us to maintain our uh, commitment to bringing the highest quality and best care uh, for all of our surgical uh, patients. So Chris, thank you so much for taking some time to share with us um, a little bit of the thinking uh, uh, behind uh, the research. Absolutely, thanks Tom, happy to do it anytime.